this video, we will be having an overview for chapter two, atoms and elements. So first we will go over a few laws, the first of which is the law of conservation of mass, which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted into energy. Here's an example of a chemical reaction with the law of conservation of mass in mind. Sodium and chlorine will react. This total mass of 19.6 grams in a perfect world will produce exactly 19.6 grams of sodium chloride. Although in a lab setting, this is not true because we have mass that is lost due to environmental conditions or imperfect conditions in the lab. Um, some matter gets stuck to the tube, the glass, etc. So, but in a perfect world, the law of conservation of mass is true, where the total mass of the reactants will equal the total mass of a product, which we call 100% yield. Another law is the law of definite proportions, which states that if you have a sample of a given compound, such as CO2, regardless of where it's from, the ratio of carbon will be equal to the ratio of oxygen. And this is true for every compound. That's what makes each compound unique from another compound. There is a set ratio of element to element. So for CO2, there's not some carbon dioxide molecules that have CO. That's, another, that's a different compound entirely. That's carbon monoxide, which can kill you. Carbon dioxide, CO2, that ratio of carbon to oxygen is actually, you know, is very important. We exhale it. So here's an idea of the law of definite proportions where there is a de definite mass ratio between different elements in a compound. So oxygen in water, there is 16 grams of oxygen in, water, in one mole of water, and there is only two grams of hydrogen. So one oxygen per every two hydrogens. And we'll get to moles and the... Uh, grams per mole and molar mass in a few minutes. So the law of multiple proportions is another law which states that if you have two elements that can form different compounds, such as nitrogen and oxygen, which can form three compounds in this case, there is more, but in this example, we'll just cover three. The ratios between the nitrogen and oxygen, if those ratios are divided by each other, you have whole numbers, that the elements arrange themselves in whole number ratios in different chemical compounds, even if you have the same element in different compounds. Dalton's atomic theory. So Dalton was a scientist who had an atomic theory. His theory was, you know, mostly right with missing a little bit, but this was very good for the 1800s. One, each element is composed of tiny indestructible particle called atoms. This is true, but these particles we know are not indestructible because we have nuclear reactions which can break atoms apart. Two, all atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from atoms of other elements. This is for the most part true, but then we have isotopes which are the same element with a different mass. The protons and the electrons might be the same, but the neutrons are different, and we'll learn about isotopes in a second. Three, atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form molecules of compounds. This is true because we have simple whole number ratios and there cannot be part of an atom. Four, chemical reactions, um, atoms of one element cannot change into that of another. This is incorrect because we have nuclear reactions where a nuclear event can create different elements so the periodic table, here's what it looks like. We have a bunch of symbols. The top number is your important atomic number. The atomic number is a number of protons. Very important to know. For every atom of chlorine, it has 17 protons. If it has 18 protons, it's not chlorine. If it has 16 protons, it's not chlorine. Chlorine is 17 protons. That is what defines it. In the middle, you have the symbol. The bottom decimal number is the average atomic mass average atomic mass, meaning the weighted average between all of the isotopes of chlorine. Chlorine happens to have two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Each of them have natural abundance percentages. Chlorine 35 is 75%, chlorine 37 is 24%. If you were to take the weighted average of these masses, you get 35.45%, which is the average atomic mass for chlorine. Isotopes are the same element, so atoms of the same element, with a different number of neutrons. In this case, we'll just talk about neutral atoms. So in a neutral atom, the positives, meaning the protons, are the same as the negatives, meaning the electrons. So protons and electrons will equal the same number. So for chlorine, like we said before, 17 
protons. If we have 17 protons, it's chlorine. For a neutral chlorine, it also has 17 electrons. But for the light isotope of chlorine 35, 35 denotes the mass number, which is the protons plus the neutrons. So 17 protons plus 18 neutrons would equal 35, meaning because we know the mass is 35, we can do 35 minus the protons, which are 17. 35 minus 17 is 18. That is the number of neutrons. For the heavy isotope of chlorine 37, 37 is the mass number. Minus 17 protons equals 20. 20 is the number of neutrons for chlorine 37. So in the atom, you have the protons, which are positively charged, located in the nucleus and have a mass of about 1 AMU or one gram per mole. It's important to know the three subatomic particles, where they're located, and their charges and masses. So neutrons are neutral, they are located in the nucleus, and their mass is about one as well. So neutrons and protons weigh almost the same, but neutrons are a little bit heavier. Fun fact, neutrons weigh more than a proton and electron put together. Then we have the third one, which is which are electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. They are located around the nucleus in atomic orbitals, and they have a very small mass of 0 0.00055 AMU. How do we discover these subatomic particles, and how do we discover isotopes? By a mass spectrometer. So it is a device that can separate atoms and molecules based on its based on their mass. And with that, we can have a mass spectrum. A mass spectrum can help us determine different isotopes that are abundant in a chemical sample. So if we have a big sample of chlorine, it can actually separate the relative masses of 35 and 37. So we can denote our two isotopes and their relative abundances. Then we have the concept of the mole. So the mole is a chemist's dozen, which means it's just a number. So one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. This number will be given on exams, but it's very important to memorize, and you probably will memorize it over time. It's called Avogadro's number. You can have a mole of anything if you had enough space to contain it. You can have a mole of grass, a mole of ants, a mole of people. It is just a number. But we, in chemistry, use this number to quantify how small atoms are in a tangible sense, because atoms are so small, we can't count one, two, or even 10 of them. We need to use numbers as large as moles to be able to make them tangible. So for example, one mole of carbon weighs 12.01 grams, and that can fit in your hand pretty easily. One mole of phosphorus weighs about 35 grams. So one mole of iron weighs about 55 grams, and, and so forth. So and these numbers come from the periodic table. They are below the symbol as the average atomic mass. We can use the average atomic mass and we can use the Avogadro's number as a conversion factor. So for example, if we have a number of moles and we want to convert it to molecules, we can multiply it by Avogadro's number. If we have a number of molecules and we want to convert it to moles, we divide by Avogadro's number. We can also use the average atomic mass or the molar mass of a compound to convert from grams to moles and backwards. So here's a concept map explaining all this. So if you have a 24 gram sample of carbon, so stay with me here, 24 grams, the atomic mass, the molar mass of carbon is 12. So 24 grams is a sample. If we want to convert that 24 gram sample to moles, 24 divided by the atomic mass, which is gram per mole. So if we know that one mole has 12 grams, 24 grams has 24 divided by 12, which is two moles. If we want to go from moles to atoms, we take, we know that Avogadro's number tells us there is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. If we have two moles, we multiply that by Avogadro's number and we get the number of atoms. And this can be undone by division. We'll do some examples in class. There's my cat. And we have elements of the periodic table. So you have links to the periodic table on Canvas. We have our metals, our nonmetals, and our metalloids. So our metals, they are located on the left side of the periodic table and the middle. And in the middle, they're called our transition metals. On the left, we have our alkali metals and our alkali earth metals. The most important thing, besides they're being good conductors, they can be malleable, they can be ductile is their ability to lose electrons to become cations. So metals lose electrons 
when they undergo an ionic change or are part of an ionic bond, and they become what we call cations or positively charged. So they lose negatives, which are electrons, and they become positive. So these are cations. Nonmetals are on the upper right side of the periodic table, and they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Usually they're in a powder or a gas form, and they tend to gain electrons when they undergo an ionic change or any kind of, or even a covalent change. Meaning that they, when in an ionic bond, nonmetals gain electrons to become negatively charged. So metals become positively charged, nonmetals become negatively charged. Some nonmetals form diatomic gases such as H2, O2, F2, Br2, I2, N2, and Cl2. There are also the, um, the noble gases, which are inert. So the diatomic gases and the noble gases don't like to react. They don't gain or lose electrons, and they're pretty stable where they are. So they don't have a charge. But other nonmetals can easily gain a charge, such as nitrogen, uh, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or phosphorus, for example. Then there are the intermediate elements called metalloids. These are great semiconductors. So you have silicon and germanium, for example. So here's the periodic table. We have our main group elements in yellow, which means that, you know, main group, they're physically taller in the periodic table. So we have our group 1A, 2A. We skip the middle, and we go to boron, 3A, carbon, 4A, etc. These A groups are important because we can use them to easily determine the charge of elements in that group. For example, magnesium, it's in group 2A. When it becomes an ion, it becomes 2+. Plus. For nitrogen, nitrogen is in 5A, it becomes 3 minus. So the way it works, just for just to be quick, lit the group 1A is plus 1, 2A is plus 2, 3A not including boron is plus 3, 4A is not plus 4. Since we're now talking about nonmetals that like to become negatively charged, 4A is minus 4, 5A is minus 3, 6A is minus 2, 7A is minus 1. And then 8A is minus zero because they're noble gases and they don't lose or gain any electrons because they're happy. Our transition metals, they are always in transition. So they can either lose one electron, two, three, four, or even five to become positive one, two, three, four, or five. Our noble gases don't like to react. Our group one, we call them alkaline metals. Our group two, we call alkaline earth metals. Our group 7A we ca are called halogens. They are very reactive. And these are all some of the ions. So ions are when an atom loses or gains an electron to have a charge, either a positive or a negative charge. Very important are the last two bullet points just to memorize and understand. Metals, they lose electrons and become positively charged. They are losing negatives to become positive. Nonmetals gain electrons and become negatively charged. So nonmetals, they are getting negatives and becoming more negative. So here's a chart showing the periodic table and some charges, but not all of them, of the ones you should know. There are a few here that aren't listed, but I will talk about those in class, such as phosphorus is minus three. That's a good one to know as well. Uh, zinc is plus two, even though it's located in the transition metals. It's not really a transition metal because it only has one possible charge state. Silver is another one. It only has one charge of positive one. So we talked about the mass and the number of protons and neutrons, but for a specific isotope, we have the symbol called a nuclear symbol. The nuclear symbol is different than the periodic table symbol. The chemical symbol is the same, but on the top left, you have a mass number. The mass number is the isotope mass. And it is a whole number. It is not the average atomic mass. The atomic number below it is just that, the atomic number, which is the same on the periodic table. So for neon, it's 10. And that means neon has 10 protons. Every isotope of neon has 10 protons. That's what makes it neon. So here on the bottom right, we have three isotopes of neon. Neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. The number of neutrons differs, but the number of protons is the same. To figure out the number of neutrons, all you have to do is subtract the number of protons from the mass number. So for neon 21, 21 minus 10 equals 11. That's 11 protons. So if we want to calculate the number or the mass number, important formula, the mass number equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons.
And then there's the periodic table again. We already spoke about isotopes. And there are a few key experiments that helped us to, helped us discover the interworkings and the subatomic particles. The first is J.J. Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment, which helped us identify the electron. The electron, a beam, he, he shot a beam through a, um, an electrical potential gradient, and he saw that the beam curved towards the positive end, which means that there is something in the atom that is negatively charged in order for it to go towards a positive. So this means there is some negative electrical charge. Millikan's oil drop experiment helped to quantify that negative electrical charge. So after that, we now have a specific charge, so negative 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs, and we have the mass of an electron, which is 9.1 times 10 to negative 18 grams. This was all determined by those experiments. Then we have Thomson's plum pudding model, which is not true, but it's one way of describing the atom. Basically saying that electrons are in this plum pudding of a sphere of positivity. So we should all have a sphere of positivity in our lives, but this sphere refers to the presence of protons and neutrons. And then you have the electrons dispersed throughout. But we know, based on Rutherford's gold foil experiment, that this is not true. So Rutherford, what he did was he shot a beam of alpha particles, also known as helium atoms, through a golden foil. But what he saw is, contrary to what people would believe based on the plum pudding model, most of these alpha particles went straight through the gold foil, about 98% of them. This means, with only a little bit of deflection, that most of the atom of the gold foil is empty space because the alpha particle had no problem going through it. So over 98% went through, about 2% bounced off, and about 0.1% bounced exactly you know, 90 degrees off, right back at the, at the source. So what this means is you have a very small, dense particle in the middle that contains most of the mass, but not much of the space. And the atom is mostly empty space. So that dense particle in the middle is called the nucleus. And they also determined that the dense particle was positively charged because of the large deflections. So here's our nuclear model where most of the alpha particles go right through and it's a lot of empty space. We also have our protons and we have a charge and mass of those. So this was also discovered in that same era. Our neutrons, we discovered as well. So Rutherford's model did have a problem because he thought that the nucleus was just protons, but now we know it's protons and neutrons. And his problem arose because helium has a mass of four, while hydrogen only has a mass of one. But their proton numbers are only one off. Hydrogen is one proton and helium is two but the mass of helium is four times that of hydrogen. So the way he described this was by the existence of a neutron. And this was proposed by James Chadwick. So neutrons have no charge, but their mass is very close to that of a proton. And this was later proven true. So we have our masses in kilograms and in AMU, and our charges in uh, relative charges of plus and minus, and our charge in coulombs, which we don't really need to focus on in this class of our three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So that's it. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and comment if you have any questions, and stay tuned for more overview videos. Happy studying, and have a good one.